A British newspaper included him on their list of 1,000 influential people of the 20th century. He was the most significant figure to emerge during the wave of new religious movements that swept the Western world during the 1960s and 70s. He was an evangelist who drew the attention of the world over several decades and created an enormous peace-oriented enterprise. When he passed away in 2012, people of all races, nationalities, and religions came to pay tribute. That person is none other than the Reverend Sun Myung Moon. I naturally respect Mr. Moon. The activity of Reverend Moon is a very important. Why I consider it important? Because start of the insertion of the United Nations. Reverend Sun Myung Moon was a spiritual leader. As is the case with all spiritual leaders in history, he had to strive throughout his life to overcome numerous obstacles. Initially, his work was focused in North America, but his philosophy was soon spread to also encompass the South American continent. Reverend Sung Myung Moon caught the attention of everyone. What is it that Reverend Moon left behind in the Americas? California in the western United States. We visited San Francisco, a city on America's Pacific coast. The most popular tourist attraction there is the city's landmark Golden Gate Bridge. San Francisco is renowned for being the most progressive and liberal city in the United States. Tourists flock to the city because they want to experience that free and romantic feeling. One of the must-see attractions are the trams, which have been running for more than a century. They carry tourists all over San Francisco. Beside the tram lines, the city boasts another famous landmark. Hills situated right in the center of the city. They're known as Twin Peaks. 50 years ago, this place had special meaning for the Reverend Sun Myung Moon. In 1965, this was the beginning of the car tour where he took, made holy grounds across America. This is the first one. It's Twin Peaks, and this is the peak that he... Although just 280 meters above sea level, from the top of the Twin Peaks, you have a panoramic view of San Francisco, with the breezes coming from the Pacific Ocean. What was it that Reverend Moon did here? It was from the top of the Twin Peaks, on February 15, 1965, that he initiated his grand tour of all regions of the United States. His method of transportation was a simple automobile. One could say that it was a reckless attempt, such a tour in a land where one neither speaks the language nor is accustomed to the culture. The tour was completed in just 44 days, during which Reverend Moon passed through 55 cities in 48 states. A few years later, he embarked on a second tour, this time a nationwide speaking tour from 1972 to 1974. He visited 70 cities, hoping to convey the true family values and the meaning of world peace to the American people. The tour culminated in downtown Manhattan, New York City. The 1970s saw a period of great chaos in America. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War all contributed to the rise of the so-called hippie culture. More and more young people were falling into drugs and alcohol. The Christian spirit that had kind of been the root of the Pilgrim Fathers and the early American uh, settlers was becoming more and more weak and uh, declining. Also. Reverend Moon is very concerned about the rise of communism. Americans don't quite understand the nature of this threat. Uh, and in fact, there are many on the left who are, in, some of them also in the media and uh, in academic circles, who are guiding America much more in a left-wing way, in communist way. So he felt, really, we have to address the de decline of kind of spiritual values. 
the Lincoln Center, one of Manhattan's tourist attractions. In this grand auditorium, renowned for hosting world-famous performers, Reverend Moon gave his first speeches. Even though the tickets to get in were expensive, the hall was filled to capacity for each speech. Three years after the speech event at the Lincoln Center, Reverend Moon planned another speaking engagement in Manhattan. Once the news had spread that Reverend Moon was holding a speaking event, 30,000 people came to see him. Madison Square Garden has a more than 130-year history. This, the home court of an American professional basketball team, was the venue for Reverend Moon's public speech. The response was so enthusiastic that the 20,000 seats initially prepared were all sold out and an additional 5,000 had to be added to accommodate the extra guests. Some are curious. Who is this Oriental man? And uh, why are these people, not only American people, but they would meet German and Italian and French and Latin American and Japanese? What's going on? I want to see what this man's message is. In June 1976, Reverend Moon hosted another speaking event, this time commemorating the 200th anniversary of America's independence. It was evidence of how thick and strong the layers of support had become. The event was to be held in Yankee Stadium, the home of the New York Yankees professional baseball team. Preparations at the stadium went smoothly. But shortly before the event was about to start, a storm blew up with strong gusts of wind and driving rain. It was difficult for people to remain standing, let alone have an event. The people did not leave, however. Even with the rain and wind, they wanted to listen to Reverend Moon's speech. Responding to zeal and desire of those who had come, members cleaned up the mess created by the storm and the event began. May I present the Reverend Sun Myung Moon. After a long wait, the speech event finally began. Reverend Moon took to the stage amidst thunderous applause. What was the content of his speech? It was a speech that touched the hearts of more than 30,000 Americans. At the end of that year, Newsweek magazine chose to put Reverend Moon on their cover. This was clear evidence of how well-known he had become. Then in Washington, D.C., something happened that shook the nation. This time it was at the Washington Monument, which is famous for beautiful spring cherry blossoms. This is the historic site. I'm standing here in the Washington Monument grounds uh, behind me. This is the way the stage was right here and Father was facing out to, to the throngs of people for Washington Monument. It was one of the most exciting, incredible periods of her life. But it culminated here with the Washington Monument rally and Father speaking to 300,000 people here in Washington Monument. That was 38 years ago. On September 18, 1976, more than 300,000 people came to hear Reverend Moon. It was the largest number of people to gather for a speaking event in the history of America, a record that stands to this day. Reverend Moon spoke strongly, asking the people to maintain family values, abstinence, and calling for the restoration and rebirth of Christianity.
공산주의 문제 중 여러 가지 심각한 문제들을 안고 있지만 무엇보다도 무신론에 입당한 공산주의의 위협은 가장 심각하며 하나님께서 200년간 준비하신 미국은 크게 각성하고 하나님께서 분부하신 중차대한 세계적 사명을 다하여야 할 것입니다. 미국은 오늘 각성하여야 합니다. 내일이면 늦습니다. In a nation that was experiencing more and more breakdown in families and chaos in their value system, many received his message with new hope. Although the great success of the Washington Monument rally was a cause for much celebration, it was also the beginning of much tribulation. Especially many young people gathered around Reverend Moon, studied his teachings, and became very inspired. Many changed direction in life. I was going in a bad direction, I taking drugs or I was drinking or free sex, but I realized that's wrong. When I heard Reverend Moon's teaching, I changed my life. I cleaned up. And I now want to dedicate my life. In many ways, that's very wonderful. But there was a lot of uh, concern. And many people attacked our movement brainwashing heresy, uh, false teaching, uh, and this, some formed what was called an anti-cult movement to oppose our movement and even tried politically to persecute our movement. Some were religious, some through the media, some through the political channel. Washington, D.C., where the Washington Monument rally was held. It was from the House of Representatives itself that the charges came. In 1976, one congressman alleged that there was a suspicious relationship between the Korean government and the Unification Church. Congressman Donald Frazier, who was the chairman of the House Subcommittee on International Organizations, made allegations against Colonel Bo Hee Park, Reverend Moon's translator, and who had previously worked as a military attaché at the Korean Embassy that he was acting as a front man for the Korean government. Colonel Bowie Park subsequently appeared at a public hearing on March 22, 1978. All 500 seats prepared for the hearing were filled and America's three major broadcast networks, plus major newspapers, covered it. Mr. Chairman, when I read this article, my mind and body and concern was anger. And I am Rebel Moon decisive. Although I'm an imperfect disciple, there's one thing that is absolutely sure. I do live by God's moral code and principle, taught by Reverend Moon, and I shall continue to do so the rest of my life. I cannot help but believe that you are being used as instrument of devil. You, yes, instrument of the devil. I said it, you else, who else would want to destroy a man of God but the devil? If he remembers him at all, you may get my scalp, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. But never my heart and soul. My heart and soul belong to God. The Lord is my shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here, Bowie Park declared proudly that he had only been conveying Reverend Moon's spirit of love and sacrifice in the interests of friendship between Korea and America and that he would continue to follow that path. Mr. Chairman, I am ready, sir. Thank you. However, this was only the beginning. Mainstream society in America continued attacking the Unification Church. And this time, Reverend Moon found himself accused of tax evasion. He was accused of failing to report approximately $4,000 that had accrued as interest on money transferred to an account for church activities, which had been opened in his name. For this, he was indicted by the New York District Attorney. Professor Lawrence Tribe, a renowned Harvard professor of law, criticized the decision to prosecute Reverend Moon as being based on religious bias. Some congressmen also claimed it was a case of religious persecution of the Unification Church and demanded a retrial. It echoes what I said 30 years ago when I chaired a hearing on the state of religious freedom in the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution. 
In June 1984, I reminded everyone of the deep heritage of religious freedom in America, but noted the concern of many that, quote, the present climate for religious liberty in America is not all it should be, unquote. That is true today as well, and reminds us that we must be vigilant in understanding, implementing, and defending the fundamental right of religious freedom. According to the Korean daily Dong Ah Ilbo, which translated an article published at that time by the Oakland Post, Senator Orrin Hatch, who was once chairman of the Senate Committee on the Constitution, sent a letter to an attorney in Washington, D.C., stating that three attorneys working at the Department of Justice had concluded that Reverend Moon should not be indicted. However, the trial judge dismissed the demand for retrial. and the Court of Appeal upheld Reverend Moon's conviction. As Reverend Moon was in Korea when the complaint was filed, he could easily have stayed there and avoided facing trial in a U.S. court altogether. However, when he heard about what was going on in America, he simply said, I must return there. He said, this is the work of communists trying to defame and frame me. Secondly, he said, this is their ploy to prevent me from ever returning to America. He left Korea for the United States the following day. After resolving that he would have to spend time in prison, Reverend Moon made a statement prior to entering prison in Danbury. He stated that this was an attack made by those in power, fearful of his activities and a communist plot against his victory over communism movement. After Reverend Moon's incarceration, many religious and civil organizations took to the streets on his behalf. More than 40 organizations made statements defending him, and Joseph Lowry, known as President Obama's mentor, strongly called for a reinvestigation. What I do understand is that I'm not secure until his rights are secure. And Farwell is not secure until Lowry is secure. None of us is secure until all of us are secure. But in the end, Reverend Moon began his time of incarceration at Danbury. His life in prison was publicized to the American people. Some faith leaders even formed a common suffering fellowship, volunteering to spend a week in prison with Reverend Moon. Reverend Moon's wife, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, worked with those who shared her desire for a campaign for her husband's release. Father was dedicated to a purpose and an ideal. I helped with Dr. Tribe the, from uh, Harvard and other people to get many religious leaders and religious organizations to support Father in that whole religious freedom movement. Because obviously he was put in prison for bad reasons, uh, basically persecution. But it was certainly moving to see Father's attitude in prison. It was like, we have a lot of work to do. Don't cry for me. And, you know, that kind of thing. After 13 months of incarceration, Reverend Moon was released. Many came to celebrate. Remarkably, among those that attended were representatives of the Christian faith that had previously opposed him. More people in America began to accept Reverend Moon. Yet there is still one thing about Reverend Moon that remains an issue for the American people. Among many historic events that have been held at Madison Square Garden, there is one that particularly caught the public's attention. This was the Unification Church Mass Wedding. 
In 1982, a wedding ceremony took place at which 2,075 couples were married simultaneously. Thinking that it is the family rather than religion that changes the world, Reverend Moon encouraged interracial and interreligious marriage, believing this to be the way to overcome conflict. Reverend Moon's church also acquired a former Catholic seminary on 60 acres of land in upstate New York on the banks of the Hudson River. It was here that he founded the Unification Theological Seminary, with a faculty composed of renowned scholars representing various religious persuasions. This reflected Reverend Moon's desire to teach theology from a broad and balanced religious understanding. Some time later, the Professor's World Peace Academy, which Reverend Moon founded, rescued the University of Bridgeport from financial difficulty. The university is independent and non-sectarian. 1992, True Parents, through the Professor's World Peace Academy, established a new hope for the vision of University of Bridgeport. With that, they began tying the international connections and the idea of developing leaders for a bright new world. Since that time, we've continued to grow and left way in the past the difficult days. Instead now, we have an engineering school which is state-of-the-art. We are the only university with a fully accredited college of chiropractic. We have naturopathic medicine, oriental medicine. We also have design programs. Through our efforts, we connect with many other universities in other parts of the world. The student body of some 5,000 is made up of people from many religious backgrounds, including Islam, Hinduism, and Christianity. The university is not for the promotion of one religion, but for the education it can bestow. Recently, just two years ago, the Wangu University for Oriental Medicine was founded in Las Vegas. Reverend Moon established the university for the purpose of developing medical treatments, combining Eastern and Western methods. Reverend Moon explained that the best way to help people change direction, to help people make a change in their life, is through education. Among Reverend Moon's many diverse activities, most prominent is his work in the media. He believed that the nation needed a conservative newspaper that could compete on equal terms with liberal dailies such as the New York Times and the Washington Post. It was 1982. Ronald Reagan was just a year and a few months in office. There was only one newspaper in America's national capital city, the Washington Post. It was the height of the Cold War. Brezhnev was in the Kremlin. Ronald Reagan was in the White House. The world was really affixed with fear about the potential of the Cold War. They knew that America needed another voice, but it was a voice not like the liberal mainstream media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the network news at the time. The Washington Times became known during the Reagan administration as the newspaper even the president reads. Even now, the Washington Times ranks as the third most influential media outlet in the U.S. Congress. That was through the Reagan administration, then the Bush administration, Bush 41, followed by the Clinton administration, Again, Bush 43, the younger Bush, and now the Obama administration. We've always held the American leaders accountable and tried our best to give them the best news and opinion to help guide their decision makers. In left-leaning American society, the Washington Times represented a conservative voice and worked to preserve a balanced view between right and left in the nation. As a result, it has become a newspaper that is respected by both liberals and conservatives. The Washington Times is a journal that has left its mark on American political history. We move forward during the Cold War without making any concessions to communism. The Washington Times played an important role in preventing the spread of communism in America and even in contributing to major change. After the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, communist nations began to collapse one by one. 
After the Soviet Union finally collapsed in 1991, the era of communism that had plagued much of the 20th century ended, and Reverend Moon's 40-year victory over communism campaign could finally come to a conclusion. On August 12, 2014, the ceremony to mark the second anniversary of Reverend Sun Myung Moon's ascension to the heavenly world was held. In honor of Reverend Moon's 40 years of work in America, the New Hope Singers performed. Many from around the world visited to pay their respects. Present and former heads of state and prominent figures in various fields shed new light on his work. Today, given the many challenges faced around the globe, here on the Korean Peninsula and in America, we stand together with you and are confident with your leadership and a unified effort among faith-based organizations, families can be strengthened with a God-centered approach that reduces divorce and immorality. Today, the spirit and will of Reverend Sung Myung Moon continue unwaveringly in his wife, Hak Jahan Moon. <laughs> August 11th, the Sunhok Peace Prize Committee, which is made up of prominent figures around the world who share Reverend and Mrs. Moon's ideal for peace, was officially launched. We will do our utmost to practice the true love that transcends races, religions and nations based on the ideology of peace that humankind is one family. The 12 member Sunhok Peace Prize Committee planned to raise the Sunhok Peace Prize to become second only to the Nobel Peace Prize. Among the events marking the second anniversary of Reverend Sun Myung Moon's ascension was an international conference. Under the auspices of the Universal Peace Federation, 16 present and former leaders of nations considered the conference theme of peace, security, and development. Together they sought solutions that might foster peace in the world. Religious leaders representing Buddhism, Christianity, Confucianism, Islam, Jainism, and Judaism sat together with the mindset to transcend their own religious views to embrace all humanity. We have invested our entire being, the salvation of humankind, and the realization of a peaceful world. We have faced many challenges and tribulations on this path, but we have never undeterred in carrying out our heavenly mission. I pray that we can work together in this great mission to build a unified world of peace and prosperity. At the two-day conference, Reverend Moon's philosophy of harmony between North America and South America drew much attention. Much deep thought was given to the works of the Reverend Moon, who had made the American continent his home. In North America, Reverend Moon's spirit to work for peace is still very much alive in 2014. Just as he had traveled throughout the United States some 50 years earlier, People gathered with the intention of following that same itinerary. They set out on the long journey of 21,000 kilometers for which they would devote the next 43 days. That great distance would be covered by bus. As they followed Reverend Moon's itinerary of some decades earlier, they met with political leaders, with representatives of the Jewish and Christian faiths, and with other religious leaders. Their journey was undertaken in order to practice a way of peace that reaches beyond nationality, race, and religion. The solid conviction and devotion of Reverend Moon, who urgently pursued the ideal world of peace, is still now inspiring people to step forward. 
I just want to say this is one of the most awesome spirit reviving experiences I've had in my life and I just want to say God is with us. It's good that there's a bus that is representing God going around even that bus itself is open. It's awesome. It's an awesome experience. It's really fun and even if you don't Maybe you don't know what you're doing here or, you know, you just hop on because your parents tell you to. I really feel like God can work through that and really show you something that maybe you weren't expecting. In conclusion, the path of peace the Reverend Sun Myung Moon walked has undoubtedly impacted many people's lives and is changing the world little by little. Thank you, Father Moon, for consecrating this place. Thank you for your vision. And I believe in God's hope for America. I believe in God's hope. Of America. On many of the journeys the Reverend Sun Myung Moon made, whether from North America to South America or elsewhere in the world, he was accompanied by his wife, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon. This is the path to peace that is the hope of all people. 자유롭고 평화롭고 행복한 세상에서 살고 싶어 하는 마음은 같습니다. 한 마음 한 뜻으로 움직이게 될때 인류가 염원하는 하나의 세계 반드시 이룰 수 있습니다. It is a path that requires strong conviction and strong will. A path that transcends religion, transcends race, and transcends nationality. Along that path in the days to come, the flowers of peace will bloom.